You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky. Uh, you know, Andy, there's a there's a famous story about the time that uh, Prince rented out Carlos Boozer's house and Carlos left and came back and the whole damn thing was purple. Like by the time yeah. he got back, that's basically you. You leave town for a couple of days and the Lakers, they're totally unrecognizable by the time you come back. Yeah, let me tell you something. I, I was truly off the grid. Like for a couple of days, I was without any type of internet access whatsoever. Killing what you ate. All of that, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, it was somewhere between... A man off glamping. the grid. No, this was not glamping. I, I My my family and a few uh, friends of my daughter's, um, like school friends, we had uh, agreed to do a camping trip around this time. Like it was actually agreed upon with nobody consulting me, but it was, <laughs> it was well, much less before anyone asked me, Hey, does this happen to conflict uh, with anything you might be doing professionally? Oh, not really just the beginning of free agency. And you know, if anyone's been in a relationship, you know, you can be told, Hey, it's all right if you don't go, but it's not really all right. If you don't go <laughs> at all. Um, yeah, it's so, a choice, but it's not a choice. So yeah, you had you were out of cell service. I, I, I made a, you were I made off a to Twitter. Yeah, I made a compromise. I left the trip early, but I went for a couple of days. Gorgeous, big sir. It's really pretty. Um, I'm not necessarily a camper, so to speak. No. It's not, not necessarily my jam, but it, not it an was out, not an outdoorsman in the traditional. No, sense. I like the outdoors. I don't like no, but not an outdoorsman. Um, no, yeah, no. It's a man. We've invented indoor beds. It right. makes a lot of sense. So you you come back so, though, yeah, and like the whole oh damn God. thing is different. <laughs> oh my God! I mean, like it it was as if like time and space reinvented itself when it comes to the Lakers. Like in terms of purple and gold universes, I was like, holy hell! What? What just happened? Yeah, what happened? It was, it was a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I on uh, Tuesday's show, I, I obviously recapped a lot of what they did when free agency opened on Monday, and we're going to talk about some of those moves because the moves that they made on Tuesday obviously uh, are impacted by what they did on Monday and how this all fits together. But the Lakers incredibly active again on Tuesday. Four players, if you include re-signing Taylor Horton Tucker. Uh, so they 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 commit to four roster spots. We're going to talk about all of them right now and then go back a little bit, Andy, to yesterday and just see how all of this stuff fits together. Because on the one hand, uh, it is the Lakers have done very good work in terms of using their money on players that could give them value. On the other hand, um, there are questions about how all of this stuff is going to fit together. So let's let's start with Tuesday's moves. And probably the easiest one to have forecasted, the one that had a Thanosian inevitability to it, Carmelo Anthony joining the Lakers on a one-year deal. Yeah, th this felt like something that had been in, in the works for a while. I mean, let's be honest, the Lakers have had this thing in the works for about a decade. They, they've been trying <laughs> right. to get finally, Anthony finally <laughs> on this team. <laughs> like, you know, even go like they've been going at this for so long, even during a time where Kobe and Carmelo, who were extremely close, even they said at the time, no, this is not a good idea. This doesn't really make sense. But uh, for this team, I do think it makes sense. You can see what Melo can bring in terms of, you know, having reinvented himself over the last couple of years, he's become much more willing to take on really a, a role player status. You know, he's still right, a he started, he started when he went to Portland, he started most of those games in his first season. Uh, and then this year, are we calling this year, this year is this year officially last year, last it's year, last, last year. Okay. So last season, then he took really, like you say, a true bench role. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think he started three games out of the 69 that he played or something like that. And he was very productive in it. it. It worked out very well. Yeah. I mean, he's the deficiencies that have been with Carl Carmelo Anthony, even during his prime are still there. I mean, he is somebody that you are going to have to, if not cover defensively, because I'm not, we're going to get into this. I'm not sure this team 
as currently just constructed is capable of covering for like one guy. <laughs> like they're going to have to kind of cover take all a for each other. Yeah. It's going to take a village and the village is named Anthony Davis and LeBron James, but it's a village and, and, and Dwight <laughs> when he plays, when he plays, but like Dwight you know, uh, could very well have a nervous breakdown. Yeah, that, second unit, <laughs> that second unit is going to be prolific in some way. It's actually just going to be prolific. It's going to be prolific at scoring points and prolific at allowing them. But you know, Mello makes a lot of sense. He He's become very dependent dependable in this type of role he's he's always been somebody that teammates have just adored even during periods mm-hmm. where he was pretty controversial he has always been among the more popular players in the league everybody knows he and lebron are extremely close friends this is a team that has needed shooting it there are Issues. Right, and, and Mello went thirty-eight and a half percent in his first year in Portland, forty-one percent in his yeah. in his second. Again, like this is there, the guy he has become. Absolutely, yeah. there are there are going to be issues, in, in the same way there's going to be issues with a lot of these guys we talk about. But Mello makes a lot of sense. You just have to understand he is not that Carmelo Anthony, anymore. right? And, and and honestly, you don't want him to be because you know th- that guy who really had trouble sticking in the league. You need you know was out of the league for a while. Um, in part because he wasn't capable of being a primary scorer anymore, but still thought of himself that way. In this role as a secondary guy, you know, averaging nearly 20 points per 36 minutes, he can still be very productive 20 minutes a night, but he's doing it in very different ways. When he catches it and shoots it, when he gets the ball, you know, thrown to him and he does it that way, he's still he is very efficient. When he isolates, he's not. And so how he's used in that second unit um, will be. And it's not inconceivable to me that in the right matchup he might close a game here and there. But as he primarily as a second unit guy, we don't need to get into you know some of the other stuff. But like as a second unit guy, um, if he is utilized correctly um, to where he is not asked to, to isolate, he should be a very productive member yeah. of that. And you want to talk about a guy, Andy, who is hungry to win a ring and will do what is asked of him. I think is one thousand percent Carmelo Anthony. So big thumbs up um, for this signing. And I should say. People are bitching at me, Andy, because they don't like my reaction to the Alex Caruso thing. And I'm sure you have some thoughts on it that we'll get to before the end of the show. Um, I can still dislike the Alex Caruso thing and think the Lakers have done a very good job spending their money. I said it last night. I'll say it again tonight. Um, Second guy that they did today that they picked up. This was an interesting one and one that I did not see coming. Former Hornets guard Malik Monk. Um, He broke the string of guys who aren't 38 or whatever that they signed (laughs) um he's just 23 years old so um you know they 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 found a young dude he's coming off his best season from a shooting standpoint in charlotte 41 percent of his threes last year well beyond his career numbers and so i think the big question with malik monk andy is whether or not what he did last year is an aberration in the sense that, you know, Kyle Kuzma's rookie three point shooting numbers turned out to be a little bit of of uh, the exception to the rule. Or is that the natural progression of a young player who scored very well at Kentucky um, or maybe the influence of having a better point guard around him like LaMelo Ball? And certainly he's going to have plenty of people to set him up for open three pointers. Um, in L.A. with between Westbrook, Kendrick Nunn, who we'll get to, LeBron, Anthony Davis. He's going to have guys who can do that. I, I'm i not entirely sure where he fits in when it's all said and done, but for a million and a half bucks or whatever it turns out, I think it's a great pickup. Yeah, it's definitely worth a flyer. Um, the SB Nation Hornets blog at The Hive, It's a, they do a really good job. I was reading a piece about this after Malik Monk because, to be totally honest, he wasn't he was not somebody that I had even considered as a possibility because I thought he'd be way too expensive. And they had yeah, said absolutely. that even, even taking into account his inconsistencies last season and during the four years he was in Charlotte as a lottery pick, he was their eleventh overall pick in 2017. They had pegged his market value as somewhere between eight to fifteen. So regardless of how this turns out, I mean, it, it's a steal just in terms of having the opportunity. Like, like you said before, his 40% three-point shooting is definitely an anomaly in terms of what he's done in his career. And it'll be really interesting to see if that's something to build on or if it's similar to what the Lakers saw last season with Dennis Schroeder. And 
that one season in OKC that Mm -hmm. turned out to be the exception that proved the rule. Like Malik Monk, obviously there's a lot of theoretical, if nothing else, room to grow. He is very young and at the risk of sounding disparaging, he's been part of an organization that's often had its head up his own ass. So you you can't blame him if, if uh, and also he people, hasn't people, been side properly note, nurtured. People underrate how difficult that is to do. Yeah. To stick your head up your own butt. <laughs> that <laughs> is, <laughs> it's difficult to do. And that frankly, you got to want it. Challenging. Um, I just, yeah. I, the, the funny thing about that being Monk, said, though, really quick. Though, oh, right? yeah, that sure. Being, go ahead. That being said, it does give me a bit of pause that a team like Charlotte that is in a rebuilding stage and is looking to grow young collectively would be as indifferent towards a lottery pick of their own coming off basically a career best season. There, sure. there can be there can be a lot of different explanations for it and you know I've been reading a bit that he had some issues with coach all that different stuff but it is something to be thinking about and looking more into it, it, as Malik is, Monk is now on a radar more. Right. The difference is, though, just because like, the number that it would have, that Charlotte would have had to pay to keep him is far different than any other team. So, I mean, I think that, you know, that the cost benefit goes there um, to some degree. But the part that I think is, is so fascinating about this is this is essentially a make good deal. Like if he plays, he's coming to LA with the idea that he can play well, reestablish a better market value and go you know, sign a real contract somewhere else. It won't be the Lakers, you know, the, 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 the rules about one year dudes sure. and all this kind of stuff with the way that the team is being reconstructed. I don't know how much he's even going to play. Like in theory, he is the, the, you know, the, the two guard coming off the bench and, you know, are, you know, splits time in the, in the backcourt with, with THT sliding to the three. I mean, there are lineup combinations obviously where he can play, but you know, yesterday, Monday, they signed Wayne Ellington. And so you know, it's, it's hard to play both of those guys. Like, so it's, and, and we don't have to debate that right now. There's plenty of time to debate how these rotation questions are going to come out, but it, it's one of the themes I think of, of this roster that they have put together is that while there are a lot of really good players and good values, figuring out how the pieces fit together with some exception, Kendrick Nunn, who will maybe we'll get to here in a second, makes a ton of sense in exactly the spot that he's in. Dwight Howard, it's like, okay, that's that's easy to figure out. But some of these other guys, like, you know, whether it's Baysmore, Ellington, um, you know, Malik Monk, how they use Ariza, how they, it's like, it, well, it's, I think it's, for a lot it's of it's interesting. I, it is. Oh, God, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, they're going to be watch, an endlessly right? fascinating team this year. I think for a lot of these backcourt guys, it's going to start coming down to who hurts us least defensively. Yeah, because a lot of their a lot of their skill sets are pretty similar, not not necessarily right. redundant, but similar. And for Monk, who is a more, di- albeit very inconsistent, um, a more dynamic scorer, obviously than Wayne Ellington, he is. Unless this shooting turns out to be the real deal, and he can, you know, do it on the volume and all that kind of stuff, he is not the kind of guy who is a respected gravity-inducing shooter that Wayne Ellington is. And so, and he is a and Ellington is not Ellington is not a good defender. Monk is a terrible defender. Right, and um, and, yeah, and again, and Wayne Ellington, if nothing else, is experienced enough to know where he's supposed to go. Sure, we covered we covered him when he was with the Lakers that one stint. Great dude. Great locker room guy, very popular with the team. Like yeah, you know, absolutely. he he established veteran. All right, so uh, let's take a break, and we'll do Kendrick Nunn and then uh, Taylor Horton Tucker, which was a big deal. Yes, to it bring was. him back, especially in the wake of losing Alex Caruso on Monday. The Lakers uh, bat five hundred there, I, I guess, with their own free agents. They do bring back Tht. Uh, we'll do that. We'll do him. We'll do Kendrick Nunn next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar ever. Bars covered in 100% chocolate, soft, easy to chew. Great, by the way, if you happen to be on a camping trip in Big Sur with no Wi-Fi, trying to build up the energy for discovering everything the Lakers did over 48 hours. I'll tell you, you need a full, hearty stomach, a lot of energy because they did a lot. Built Bars, they are healthy. They're great for health-conscious people. Low sugar, low calorie, high protein, high fiber. They're great for keto diets. 
awesome taste, whether you're talking about the 12 original flavors like raspberry, coconut almond, salted caramel, banana bread, new flavors like cherry barcia, lemon almond cheesecake, cookies and cream. They're perfect for somebody who doesn't want to be bored eating the same thing over and over. Great taste combinations. So go to builtbar.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You get 15% off your first order. Again, the promo code LOCKED15, 15% off at builtbar.com. So there was a lot of question as to, wait a minute, where's the that that big mid-level, I use big in air quotes, the biggest one they had, the taxpayer mid-level, $5.9 million a year that the Lakers could offer. They hadn't seemed to use it. All these deals coming down the pike, all of them were one-year deals until Tuesday afternoon, and uh, the Lakers go two years, $10 million player option for the second season for my, former Miami point guard Kendrick Nunn. He is actually one of the easiest guys to slot in, Andy. Now we just talked about that with Monk and Ellington and some of the, you know, the Baysmore, that kind of log jam and that shooting guard, sort of the two three stuff. Kendrick Nunn, that's easy. He's Russell Westbrook's backup and um, you know, a credible guy in the the games that, you know, the 10 games or whatever, 15 games that Russ might miss over the course of the season, whether because he's dinged up, because they're, you know, they're, you know, protecting his health or whatever it might be. I love this pickup. He's he's somebody that, I, you know, when you kind of target at the beginning of free agency, like I wonder if they could squeeze him in as a as a backup. Lakers fans probably remember Andy this season when he lit him up for twenty seven points, five of six from three point range. Um, he's just he's a he's a quality offender. Um, he can get go get you buckets off the bench. He can obviously stretch the floor a little bit. Thirty eight percent. Um, in terms of five million dollar backup point guards. I got no problem with this one either. Yeah, he's another guy that I would – he was not on my radar at all, even though all the signs have been pointing towards Miami letting him go. He yes. had not been on my radar at all because, similar to Malik Monk, I didn't think there was a chance they could afford him. Like they, well, I mean, they, Yeah, I mean, he I, did I really reportedly didn't. take I, – I think it was the Knicks offered him more, um, and he he – uh, apparently, you know, would wanted to, to come to LA, better shot at winning a title, whatever well, it might it, be. He's 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 actually had a taste of the finals at, at a yes. very young age. He's been a part of that. You know, he was part of that Miami team that the Lakers beat in the finals in 2020. He's had an interesting route with them in that he's been in and out of the rotation both during the regular season and especially during the playoffs with, with Kyle Lowry arriving via sign and trade to the Heat. His role ends up less defined, I guess, less important than even it had been during you know those inconsistent periods. But for the Lakers, he he brings a really interesting dimension. Like you know, like Malik Monk, we talked about before. The I think his defense will basically set the ceiling for how important a player he can be on this team. He's, you know, like if he can, to be fair, he is a you know his metrics with Miami. He is not a a negative defensive guy. He's just not really not a positive. He's fine on that side. He's, you know, the the Heat are a little bit better offensively when he plays, a little bit worse defensively. But you know, get, you go to the B ball index guys and and uh, you know, uh, Cranjo Smith basketball, and you look at some of the numbers he's put out. He's not he's not a liability on that side of the in the way that Malik Monk had over his career. Sure. That being said, though, I mean, he's not a stopper. Kendrick Nunn is more likely to lose time in the fourth quarter because of his defense than become a defensive staple. That being based on what we've seen, that being said, he has an opportunity, though, because if if he starts picking up his defense, like if he starts turning it into something where at the very least he's not a problem defensively or if he's not seen as a weakness, he could have an opportunity to start establishing himself more in, in these Here's, important but the, moments. What you're talking about is basically fundamental. The entire, like, because I mean, Westbrook is a big enough guard. Obviously, you know, he he can. You could theoretically not. You're not playing a bunch of miniatures if you play uh, Kendrick Nunn and Westbrook together. Um, the difference is, you know, you're looking for somebody to protect Westbrook. Yeah. In a way that you weren't necessarily looking for somebody to protect Dennis Schroeder or go back two years, Avery Bradley, or like, you know, all these different combinations that the Lakers had throughout the playoffs and, and other stuff. I mean, like, you know, it's 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 just different. 
and you know again caruso is really good at that one thing so which of these guys is going to in what lineup configuration is going to stick like if you ask me right now what my closing lineup probably is i think it's uh russ baysmore uh lebron um russ baysmore lebron trevor ariza and ad and I think as a starting lineup, I think you throw Gasol in there right now. You take Ariza out. Ariza comes off the bench. But like all of this stuff is very fluid, and it could take most of the season to figure out how all of this works. And I agree with you. Defense really is going to be the thing. Yeah. But you know, as a as a you know, none you know, though could the, be a very important guy with this team. He's a, it's a if great, say, it's, a, if, it's a perfect pickup for sure. What they but I'm just talking do. about because we we've talked a lot about leading into free agency the the idea of these closing units because the Lakers had you know landed on units that they really liked pretty consistently to close out games with LeBron, AD, KCP, Caruso, and then you know usually pick a fifth guy, but they they had some pretty good options with that. If you're talking about the Lakers looking to get back into a game in the fourth quarter, Kendrick Nunn could actually be a really important guy there. Could be. Because they, they, have, they, have, look, they have no shortage of ways to try to score points this year. I mean, I, you and I say what you will about you know the, the wisdom of some of the things the Lakers have and haven't done this offseason, the Westbrook trade generally, all of this stuff. And like, I don't, none of us knows how this any of this is going to turn out. We can all basically see the risks. Um, we can all basically see the rewards. We asked them to lean into offense a little bit more, and Lord knows they've done that. Like, you know, they're going to be a team that is capable of scoring more points next year in more ways than they were last year and the year before. There's no question about that. <laughs> There's just like, like they're also going to allow more points than they did in those years. The 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 structure of this team is really going to be a test of just how good a defensive coach Frank Vogel is, just how good his systems have been. Because We've talked about the last couple of years how it's looked like it doesn't really matter who's on the floor. The Lakers have been able to remain one of the elite defenses, even during periods where LeBron and AD were hurt. But those teams had more good defenders at their right. disposal to Two try to guys, keep it, you know, right, just Kuzma, to try to keep it more KCP, patchwork until you figure Caruso, it out. Exactly, exactly, and, and that makes the, a difference. Yeah, it does make a difference. I mean, but flip guys side is, li- with length, with switchability, with all that kind of stuff. Flip side is only, this team though. This team might make it so that hopefully, so that becomes less important as they learn to start coalescing more defensively. Right. It's just there's a lot of either or. You know, whereas yeah. KCP was one of their better shooters and a good defender. Um, Kuzma, in theory, was one of their better. You know, last year was one of their better shooters and one of their better offensive reserves, and turned himself into a plus defender. Less so with Caruso in terms of the the offense, but you know he still shot forty percent from three point range, front loaded. I'm not I'm not here to stick up for Caruso shooting in the in, certainly not in the playoffs. You know, the biggest um, problem Caruso had, I think, on balance offensively, is he wasn't willing and willing just to do to make it. shots. But the volume, you know, for all the talk of Caruso and this and that, the volume that he had from three last year was virtually identical to Kent Bazemore. So yeah. I mean, it's like it's it, it I, you know. The, the the excitement over the thing that you haven't seen is is always there versus the thing that you have. Um, the last guy, this is, I got, I mean, I am, before we get to THT and just talking about this, because this is really a big deal that they brought back THT and it means a lot in terms of how all of these things that we're talking about shakes out. Can we stop for a second and just talk about how much more interesting this team has become over? I mean, for the, for, I don't know it's going to work. But man alive, like three weeks ago, a month ago, it was like, well, they could kind of sort of run it back. Maybe you find one more shoot or whatever. And then you just sit there and you spend the entire season going, man, I hope LeBron and AD don't get hurt in the playoffs. Because ultimately, like this year, though, we have got some things to look at during the regular season. Like this is going to be fun and interesting. There is only one person on the planet who does not find this team interesting, and that's Dennis Schroeder. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> Dennis Schroeder <laughs> and his former agent. <laughs> now, yeah. do you think Schroeder is firing his agent or is his agent firing Schroeder? Both could be true. <sighs> Look, I, it's hard to say. I don't. I mean, I've, I don't. I'm not even sure I know who reps Dennis Schroeder. I, I, it's a, it's not a household name. Schroeder seems to me like somebody who could be very difficult to convince 
hey, take this Alex offer. Alex Saraxis, the best one I believe be. is his name. I have no idea if that guy's a good agent. I have no idea if he's a bad agent. I have no idea if he's been whispering all the wrong things in Schroeder's ear. All I can say is Schroeder seems like a difficult guy to get off a stance. Let's talk about THT because um, big deal. Uh, the Lakers brought him back three years, $32 million. We'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by rockauto.com with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models out there. It is impossible to stock all the parts you need in a traditional chain storefront. And why would you spend 30%, 50%, a hundred percent more for the exact same auto parts at a chain store dummy or a new car dealership when you can get it all for way less at rockauto.com. For example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump, $353 from a chain store. That is highway robbery. You know how I know that, Brian? It's $216 at Rock Auto. RockAuto.com, they're a family business. They've been serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Whether you're working with a classic or a daily driver, get everything you need in a few easy clicks delivered directly to your door. So go to RockAuto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in the How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we Sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Three years, $32 million to bring back Taylor Horton Tucker. Um, very, I think, uh, reasonable deal for everybody involved. I mean, it's a great payday for THT because, you know, love the potential of what he can bring. His age, obviously, still 20, right? Or is he turned 21? Uh, he is um, going to be 21 about a month into the season. Okay, so he's still 20 years old. He is obviously uh, the closest thing the Lakers have to a youth movement. Him and uh, Malik Monk, I suppose. Um, but a, a good, it's a great Malik payday Monk for will be THT. buying a beer. That's right. It's a great, it's a great <laughs> payday for THT, um, and it's a, it's a smart move for the Lakers who need his playmaking. They need his uh, ability to put the ball on the floor and uh and to score that way um and you know hopefully he grows into a better shooter and uh, a better defender he's actually one of the reasons andy i wonder how much malik monk is going to play but anyway back to tht um i was very excited when when i saw this news come down the only thing that it bugged me about it was the timing because i just finished doing a uh, free agency update and did not have that news yet so i did (laughs) more work but other than that I, i was very pleased Look, it's great news for the Lakers. You and I have both been really high on THT's potential. What what makes this, though, really interesting to watch is the urgency that's been cranked up. Like, he needs to be ready now. He, You know, THT has shown flashes, and at times he's been a really, really good scorer attacking at the rim. He has shown signs of being an excellent playmaker. He's like we said, he's not even of legal drinking age yet, but he's also never been a rotation mainstay or somebody with a lot of responsibility. You know, he was able to be covered a lot, particularly defensively, where he would have a lot of off ball lapses or just make mistakes that kids early in their career are supposed to be making. He has to be ready now. Like, he, I remember you. we've talked before about how the Lakers in that third year for Andrew Bynum, he made that unexpected leap. This was you know, coming off that offseason where Kobe went on the radio tour demanding to be traded anywhere. And he, like everybody, did not see that leap coming for Bynum. This is something the Lakers are clearly projecting to, to take place, but they're projecting it to take place like now. This is not mm-hmm. a by year three, this is going to look like a sharp deal. Like they well, need this to look no, good. No, they now. need him to produce now. I think there's a little bit of that in there. Um, you know, obviously you, you when you're when you're the Lakers and you just traded away your your number one pick this year, you have very limited access to uh first round picks going forward. The expectation my, is my point is them. though, they're not they're not they're not doing this. Well, I'm, I'm saying it's, it, there is there is both. I think there is an element of looking at the future and seeing a guy that that could be very important for them. But yeah, they need him to be good now. They need him to produce now. If he plays 12 to 14 minutes next year in a developmental role, you know, because guys like Wayne Ellington and Kent Bazemore and and Malik Monk and all that stuff are keeping him off the floor, that's a bad sign. Um, You know, they and I don't think it'll happen. Uh, I think he's going to play. 
Um, I don't, I don't expect him to become a 42% three point shooter next year, but you know, the skill set that he showed last year. And I think the willingness to become a better defender, I, I think they look at him um, and they, they, I think we, we've talked about this like, and they use Kuz as a template. Like, Oh yeah. Kyle Kuz was a terrible defender when he got in the league, but he cared and he had sort of the requisite skill set that you need um, in terms of, you know, a, a decent head on his shoulders, a willingness to try, um, and, and, and kind of a pride in doing it correctly that I think THT has. And so, you know, and, 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 you know, he's not a tall guy, but he's got, you know, the world's most ridiculous arms. There's, there's stuff that he can do and he's shown potential. Think, it's mostly think, just like when the ball, when he's away from the ball, figuring out what he's supposed to do is, is difficult. A lot of that is reps. And I think they think he can get a lot better on that end. Yeah, I mean, with with the that length that you're talking about defensively, just in general, I mean, you could you could picture him in cross matches where he might be a reserve technically in the backcourt, but he's guarding threes, or you could picture him playing alongside two guards where he's basically serving in a point forward role. I mean, he's. I think they see a lot of versatility in that skill set. It's really the outside shooting that I think needs to open up. Pretty much everything. And this, I remember this was something I talked about with THT during his exit interview. Like, what did you start noticing in terms of the game slowing down for you in the first year where you were, where you were playing regularly and you know, you're on a scouting report. And he said, they're always playing me to drive. And in some ways it, it meant adjusting the way he would drive, but it also was a recognition of, I have to, at times do more than just drive. And that's ultimately going to get opened up with that outside mm -hmm. shot. You know, he also to be if you really want to be, I, I guess, sort of expansively thinking about this, they need him to be good because if they want to make another move, he is the only salary they have that is of yep. any importance when it comes it to is, it's, a trade. It's a it's a lo-fi uh, problem with the Caruso thing too. It's like you have now have one guy with a salary slot that isn't that basically isn't. 40 million or 2 million. And so yeah. like, him and none are basically the only guys. Right. And I, I don't know what the restrictions are on trading none, but I think it's probably just a normal January thing or whatever, but like that's, that doesn't leave you with a lot of flexibility. And so um, I just, yeah, it's a luxury. I don't think the Lakers should be worried. The Lakers feel to me like they should be like the Dodgers and like money shouldn't be a thing that keeps the Lakers, a team worth billions of dollars, from from doing stuff and you know this isn't the first time it's happened it won't be the last time the you know for all the big business stuff and the the value of the team there are in some ways run like a small business a little mom and pop kind of thing in terms of where they they choose to spend their money and so um you know well it, it's I, funny it's, Brian, just, you... it's, it's 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 the principle of 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 uh caruso as an either or decision like none of the things that have happened since then other than I guess maybe signing Kendrick Nunn, who might not have seen as much playing time, um, or you know conceived of it, although they still could have done most of the things that they've done since then could have been done with Alex Caruso. No, Caruso um, could have possibly been a starting two guard. I mean, it's correct. been really well reported from Ramona Shelburne with ESPN, Sam Amick with the Athletic that there was an opportunity for the Lakers to come to some type of compromise with Caruso because. He went to them after Chicago's offer and said, look, I would like to stay. Is there something comparable we can do with this? And ultimately the right. Lakers said, no. said no. And, so, and, and it's a, it's a fine, it, by all appearances seems oh, to be it, a financial choice. It is. And, you know, I heard Ramona talking about uh, the luxury tax figures. And this was something that I think Winhorse talked about as well, that they got from Brian, uh, that they got from Bobby Marks, who knows this stuff backwards and forwards. And, you're talking about, I believe, something like a $40 million luxury tax hit. So the idea that they are completely cutting corners, I would say, is inaccurate. I don't I would, think I, that's I, actually I, the case. That's true. What I think, though, that you can potentially question, and this is obviously where everything in the season is going to play itself out, is not necessarily are they willing to spend money. It's are they spending their money smartly? Like, you know, are they, are they spending a lot of money? Because they clearly are, in a way that actually makes the most sense. It's not that they can't win a title without Alex Caruso. People are throwing straw men all over. 
they were going to be excellent if they never made the Westbrook trade. They're going to be excellent having made the Westbrook trade. They're going to be excellent if they brought back Caruso. They're going to be excellent without bringing back Alex Caruso. But losing Caruso hurts them in a way that they have to figure out how to solve. Now, have they done a great job filling in with, you know, they've found more shooting in theory. Um, they've found um, more more offense for sure. They've got a lot of stuff. I mean, like I, I, I said Monday, I said it again on Tuesday. I said at the top of the show, I love what they've done with their free agent money. I can do two things at once. I can really like some stuff and I can really like others. I don't know if they're, they're, they're an excellent team because they have LeBron AD and Russell Westbrook. Um, I just don't know what all of this looks like. And the guys that they've signed, they've lost a lot of two-way talent and they've replaced most of it with one-way talent. Yeah, and I mean, so now they have to figure out how to do it. And I would say that that stuff matters because if part of the reason that you signed or that you traded for Westbrook was to mitigate the amount of work that LeBron has to do on the offensive side of the ball and, and, and all that, it doesn't help if you then make him do more work on the defensive side. Well, I, th I so think I think they would that's say part that of my problem. I think they would say that the guys that they have there, they see the potential in either certain guys individually or the ability no to question. make it happen collectively. You know, Frank Vogel's track record. Right. And if they and if they do, and if they can do that, then we could see the end of the season could come around and we could yeah. find that, you know what, they've done a really good job patching up what Caruso did sure. for them. I think, for example, that they think they can do for Kent Bazemore this year, what they essentially did with KCP, which is define you get a really well defined role for him and mitigate all the stuff that he doesn't do particularly well in terms of decision making and fouling and some like that, and funnel him into a place where we're like, we want you to shoot open threes and defend your ass off. Um, and hopefully that works. He's really the only in, in, in the guy who can play sort of one, two, three of all the guys that they brought. He's the only one with really any proven potential to be a plus defender. Ironically, with Bazemore, several years ago, you may recall, the Lakers had the opportunity to re-sign him when he came over as part of the Steve Blake trade that sent him to the Warriors. Right. And they didn't sign Bazemore because they were trying to save every penny to take a swing at LeBron in what would have been a completely illogical, insane signing on LeBron's part. Now, they bring in Kent Bazemore presumably at the behest of LeBron, who is, again, controlling their finances. So the whole <laughs> thing has become, it's gone full circle. It's, it's a great, it, it, it would have been, it would have been a, a, a difficult, it would not have been the best purchase back then for what he ended up signing. I think he ended up in Atlanta for like 18 million a year. Um, but now, I mean, it's a, I love the Baysmore signing. Um, I like the Dwight's. I mean, I, I like everything they've done with their free agent money, putting the pieces together in a way that's coherent and can get stops when they need it. <laughs> um, is going to be a challenge for Frank Vogel. But there is so much still left that we haven't talked about with this roster, how they're going to arrange it, who starts, who finishes, all that kind of stuff. The Lakers still have more stuff, Andy, that they could do. All right, so anyway, lots to do. I'm very excited about the rest of this week going forward, seeing how yep. they fill it out and uh, keep the questions coming, keep the responses coming. We'll do mailbags, and we'll just get as deep into this as we possibly can. We'll see everybody next Hit time. us up!